Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. We're glad that we're able to join together online, uh, even if we can't be together right now. And so we're so grateful for this uh, way of staying connected. And I think you're going to really be glad that you tuned in to watch this, to participate in this, because it has been such an encouraging lesson to study. And I believe it's going to be an encouraging lesson for you to hear and for you to study as you open God's Word this morning as we go through it. We've attached the handouts on to our post on Facebook if you want to go and print those out to follow along with us as you uh, listen to today's lesson. Or you may want to just use it to go back through it in your personal time of devotion this week and see what Holy Spirit wants to say to you after he gets done talking to you through it all today. So let's go ahead and just open up with prayer. Father God, we just... Thank you for the opportunity of having a written word, your written word that we can study. So many nations don't even have access or the freedom to that, and we just thank you that we do. We don't want to take it for granted. Holy Spirit, open our ears to hear the truth of God's word. Give us understanding. Give us insight and discernment. Show, show us the areas in our life where we need to apply God's word. And we thank you for sowing that seed deep in our heart and prepared hearts, Lord, that would cause it to grow and bear much fruit in our lives. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as many of you may have heard, if you tuned in last week, Pastor Scott did a great job giving an introduction to Philippians. Uh, he always does a great job laying the groundwork for it as we enter into a new book to study. And as you may be familiar with, we're calling this the Christian Living Series, to where we go through God's Word and we pull out truths that help us to live a life that represents Christ well. And so that's what we're going to do. And so I'm going to teach from Philippians 1, and I'm going to refer to the New Living Translation a lot. So one of the things I appreciated about Pastor saying was just encouraging us to read through Philippians a few times as we're going through this series to really get it down into our spirit, see what God is saying to us. But as I began to study this first chapter, I thought, wow, this is an amazing first Sunday of the New Year lesson to be studying and it's just perfect one thing you're going to see is is how applicable it is to where we're at right now uh, the season of life that we're all in together during these random lockdowns and uh, this pandemic and all of these things and um, I also love how God's word is alive and active that it's I can I'm going to study this you know the past few weeks be studying this looking at this going through my notes the past day or two and it's speaking to me this whole new thing that I haven't seen before but I could read it again next week and it's going to have a whole new light according to what my situation is next week. And that's just the beauty of God's word. And so I love how when we read those scriptures, it fills in the missing pieces. So, much, so many times it gives us understanding. And one thing that's helpful to me is when, especially when I'm facing a challenge is, Lord, I need a new mindset because right now I'm not thinking very good thoughts, healthy thoughts about this situation. I need your mindset in this situation. And that's what God's word does. It gives us a new strategy, a new way to look at things to where we're not falling prey to what the enemy wants us to focus on. Instead, we're keeping our eyes on the Lord. And so, Going, going, headed toward the lesson, I want you to remind you that at the time of this writing, when he's writing the church in Philippi, Paul has been on house arrest in Rome for two years. 
Does anyone feel like they maybe have been on house arrest for two years? People in California, can I get an amen? And uh, I was telling Paul, I was like, I, my Paul, I was telling my Paul, I can relate to Paul in this situation because I feel like I've been in house arrest. Uh, for those of you who don't know, at my last day at work before Christmas break was Friday the 18th, and I was looking forward to that next week. I'm going to go finish up my Christmas shopping, and I'm going to get some last odds and ends, going to go see the grandbaby and hold him for hours, and then on Sunday, Paul tested positive for COVID, and I tested negative later that day. And so uh, we did a horrible job staying away from each other. And so uh, then he tested. So we had to miss last week. And uh, then this past Wednesday, we went and got tested again. I have not had any symptoms this whole time. And his were fairly mild for like two days. And I ha still have yet to have any symptoms, but Wednesday I tested positive and he tested negative. So I'm like, how do I get the double quarantine whenever that you were the one who started all this? But, uh, but anyhow, God is good, and as you'll see and I refer to in these scriptures, God's showing us he's, he's always working. And, you know, the way I prayed was like, Lord, I know you're not going to give me this virus, but if for some reason I'm not kept from it, I just, I, I just want to glorify you. And, um, and one thing that's been wonderful, it, besides having the time that was down, even though some of it was spent fighting depression for being in my house so much, was the, the joy of just... Um, seeing my faith tested and grown because it's like what do you really believe do you really believe that God orders the steps of the righteous then if you do then you can believe he's working in this and he's working through it so I don't understand why but I trust God and um and it, it's really made me like, what do you believe do you believe God's word you know and he's been faithful to keep us and and just protect us from going in the hospital or anything like that. And so, but here's the beauty of Paul's writing is in the midst of all this, being in house arrest for so long because he preached the gospel. Joy is the dominant theme throughout this book. You can you hear him say a lot of times, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice, you know. And so I think that's really important for us to glean from this book, especially during this season. And so as a kind of a side note away from Philippians, for those of you maybe who are watching today and you're struggling with joy, I just want to assure you uh, with a few scriptures that I found on joy. Psalm 1611, it says, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Nehemiah 810 reminds us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Psalms 125, verses 5 through 6 says, Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves of the harvest with them. Jeremiah 15, 16, and this, is, this has been, the, I loved this scripture because I've felt like this before where I'll just hug my Bible as I'm studying it and be like, thank you, Lord, for your word. It says in Jeremiah 15, 16, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. James 1, 2, another good reminder, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And we'll talk about that at the end of our lesson. 
And then my favorite, which is Romans 15, 13. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I love this quote from Rick Renner as I was studying uh, different commentaries and things of, of for Philippians. And he made this quote. In our study today, here's this quote, we're going to discover that God extends a very special measure of mercy to people who feel like they are being swamped in the affairs of life. And so I love that. So encouraging. So let's begin. If you want to follow along with me in your Bible or on the handout, we're going to start reading Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. And so here's a little nugget I learned from that, because I have noticed that as I would, sometimes I'll do word searches and I'll put in grace, and I'll look up all the scriptures that say grace, or I'll put in peace, and I'll see all these scriptures that say peace. And if you'll notice that a lot of beginning of these letters, these writings, they greet people with grace and peace. May God's grace and peace be with you. May you be blessed with his grace and peace. You'll see that through a lot of the salutations and the closings. And so, as many of you know, I love to study Rick Renner's sparkling gems from the Greek and to learn about the context of these New Testament writings. And so, whenever I taught from Galatians, I mentioned how God equips us and teaches us to relate to those people that he sends us to minister. And so along that line, God had equipped Paul how to relate to those that he had sent uh, as part of his assignment, as part of his ministry, and why that he so often opened up his writings, his letters, with the greeting that included grace and peace. God give you grace and peace. So why did he use these words in his greetings? So because he was an apostle to the Gentiles or the Greek-speaking world, it was necessary for him to greet his foremost readers in a customary Greek manner. So during the New Testament days, whenever Greeks would greet one another, that instead of how we would say, hey, how are you doing? Instead of doing that, they'd say, grace. And that's how they would greet one another. And that word grace came from a Greek word that also carried the, the meaning favor. But Paul, as you know, wasn't only addressing the Greek-speaking world. As a Jew himself, he also wanted to greet the Jewish world that would be reading his epistles. So when the Jews met one another, their customary way of greeting one another would be shalom, and it's still the customary greeting, if you were to go to Israel today, exchange between Jews. And so that, many of you know, that word shalom means peace. And so if you take those two definitions into account, what Paul was basically saying is this. To those of you who are Greeks, I, great, I, I greet you with grace and favor. And to those of you who are Jews... I greet you with peace and shalom. And so these words convey also the way that God interacts with us. We thank God for his grace that he gives us to live in an, a world that's often unfriendly toward the good news, shows us how to show his grace. And he also gives us peace to deal with the everyday pressures of life. And so... This was another little nugget. I'll give you all this for free. I don't even have to pay extra for this. But if you'll notice, if when you're reading later as we go through the books of the Bible, if we make it to 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus, you'll notice that Paul added the word mercy 
in his greetings. And as I studied on that, it said that the reason that he did that was because those letters were being written to someone in the ministry who felt overwhelmed by the affairs of life. One of them, they were overwhelmed because the church was growing so fast and so quickly and so large that they were feeling overwhelmed. So it was a good problem to have, but it was still overwhelming. And so he would add mercy to his salutation, to his greeting. So let's read through verses 3 through 5. This is talking about Paul's thanksgiving in prayer. Verse 3. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you heard it until now. So by helping Paul, they were helping Christ's cause because they were choosing to partner with him. Well, this is another passage that makes me think about family life because I know that this is how our whole staff feels about those of you who choose to partner with us. And this is how we feel when we're praying for you. Our hearts are full of gratitude because of your partnership. We pray according to the law of sowing and reaping that, Lord, we pray and found in Galatians that they would reap what they've sown, God, whether that it's been in prayer, whether it's been in time, whether it's been with your talents, whether it's been in finances, your giftings. We just truly understand that we could not do this work for Christ. We could not do all of the ministry they do, that we do if you didn't partner with us the way that you do. And so we totally relate to how Paul is feeling in this passage. And then when we make these requests, that's a, a word that he uses, I make these requests, that's defined as heartfelt requests for God to answer a concrete, specific need. So you see, even, even here, when he's writing and he's thanking them for their partnership, they were blessing him and giving to him financially, even though they, were, they had their own financial struggles at the time. So he was praying, God, I pray you give them tangible, concrete, meet those concrete physical needs of this sacrificially giving church. And that's, that's exactly how we feel. The King James Version, it says in that verse, it says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And if you haven't heard that teaching, fellowship is, in Greek is koinonia which depicts a partnership or a mutual participation in some project or event. And so if you take all of those definitions, this is what verses 4 and 5 would sound like. It would read like this. I am always praying for you. In every one of my prayers, I am asking God to meet the tangible and physical needs in your lives. And I want you to know that praying for you is one of the greatest joys in my life. Why, you've been my partner in the work of the gospel from the very start, and you're still with me now. Because of that, praying for you is a very special joy to me. Isn't that beautiful? And then here's one of my very favorite verses, is verse 6, and it reads like this. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I love that reminder up here, if you can't see it in our sanctuary, but there's a banner and it has a Bible and it says, He is the author and perfecter of our faith. And that is such a comfort. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is. I don't have to work and struggle to perfect it and things like that. I just have to cooperate with him because he's the author. He wrote my faith. He wrote my faith. He's the perfecter of my faith. His work will do that complete work. 
And the reason that Paul could speak so passionately about this was because God had used his life experiences to shape him for his ministry. And he was a Jew, he was a Pharisee, and he had persecuted the Christians when he was living his life as Saul. And so probably more than, at the, I just, I, I didn't read this anywhere, I just feel like if I was Paul, I would feel like this, that he would understand more than any other Jew God's grace, the grace that God would show to the Gentiles as, as his adopted children, that he would accept them as part of his family because God had looked beyond beyond Saul's sins and failures and faults and gave him them grace as he transformed him into Paul. And I just love that. God factors in. There's a song that said that uh, I can't remember exactly the name of it, but it basically it says, you knew what you were getting into when you called my name. It's like God's not surprised by our, by our shortcomings, by how we're not completely ready for something, or our lack of education, or where we're at in the status level that this world views us at. He takes into, he factors into account your background, your level of education, your past occupations, and everything else you've accumulated from your life experiences. And when I think about that, I even think about Paul and Pastor, who are not out there working in carpentry and all of these things, but they, they did when they were young. And to think how we were making an album for Paul's parents, a photo album, and we included the transformation they did with all this woodwork here. And I just think about how God knew that, <laughs> that we would need someone who would be able to do that in here. And, and just all the different giftings that you see through our teachers, through uh, hospitality ministry, all outreach ministry. It's all these desires and things that he put in us all along the way and prepared us for. And so that's why sometimes uh, that even, you know, when God will lead us into new territory we've never experienced and even to be with unfamiliar faces because he needs and knows that we need to learn certain lessons right there that will equip us for where he's taking us. And we wouldn't have learned it if he would have just kept us in our comfort zone. And so remember that if you feel like God's stretching you. He may be preparing you for where he's taking you. And so if you feel like you haven't arrived, it's okay. Because we won't arrive until we see him face to face. As a recovering perfectionist, uh, I can relate to that statement, bringing pressure to people, because... We think that it needs to happen now. We need to be perfected now. And it's not like that. It's, it's a journey. And uh, ask God to give you joy to enjoy the journey. And um, embrace those weaknesses. You know, I remember I used to kind of beat myself up when I'd, usually I was digging for weaknesses in my life to try to fix them and uh, was exhausting myself. But what God showed me is, Will you just embrace those weaknesses? Because it's like I told you about that song. I knew what I was getting into when I called your name. And I love that because he knew my weaknesses. He knew my shortcomings. And it says that it's in those weaknesses that he's made strong. He gets the glory. He shows off because people look at me and they're like, I don't know how that she did that. And I can just... Uh, it wasn't me. It was all him. Because it's his, his strength will shine through those broken places and those cracks in our lives. And I love that God's work began for us not just the day that I first believed. It began back on the cross when he paid it all in full. He paid for my sins, for my healing, for my victory, for my freedom, for my redemption, for my wholeness, for my deliverance. For my eternal life, he paid it all. And he's continuing, now that the Holy Spirit is living in me, he's continuing and enabling me to be more and more like Christ 
every day. Now, I love this reminder from the Notes in My Life Application Bible. And so I thought it was a good question to ponder for all of us. It says, do you sometimes feel as though you aren't making enough progress in your spiritual life? Be assured that when God starts a project, he completes it. As with the Philippians, God will help you grow in grace until he has completed his work in your life. When you're discouraged, remember that God won't give up on you. When you feel incomplete or unfinished or distressed by your shortcomings, remember God's promises and provisions. Don't let, listen to this, it says, don't let your present in perfect condition, rob you of the joy of knowing Christ Jesus or keep you from growing closer to him. The enemy would want to use that as a strategy to disconnect you from God, to feel shame because of your shortcomings. Don't fall for that lie. This is a reason to run to him more because we need, know we need God more in our lives. So let's move on to verses 7 through 11. Verse 7, So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. Verse 9, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and in understanding. Verse 10, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. And verse 11, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. In verse 9 there, where he's saying, I pray that your love will overflow more and more. Sometimes the best way to influence people is to pray for them. Sometimes I used to get caught in that trap of, well, if I just say this to them, then the light bulb will come on. Oh, that's a good way to put it. If I'll just tell them this, then they'll get it. Then they'll change it. No, I was wearing myself out. I could have done better spending all that time trying to figure out the right thing to say by just praying for them and trusting that if there was something that God wanted me to tell them, Holy Spirit would tell me, and that I didn't have to go trying to figure out the way to do it to get through to them. No, I pray to the one who has the power. I love that statement. The Lord showed me that God's ability to speak to them is greater than their inability to hear him. So God will get through when the timing is right. We just need to pray for them. And I love that scripture. I hadn't remembered reading it that way, where it's in verse 11, it says, May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. So that includes, that fruit of salvation includes all the character traits that are flowing from a right relationship with God. When we love Christ rightly, he produces godly actions in us as we cooperate with him. And this fruit of righteousness involves more than kindness to believers. You see, it requires integrity in such areas as our financial matters or our speech or family conflict, or relationship with all kinds of people. An example of that are the fruits of the Spirit that we studied in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. So let's move on. Paul's joy that Christ is preached. We're going to read verses 12 through 14. Verse 12, And I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, 
that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Isn't this beautiful? And this reminds me again of family life, where he's saying, everything that's happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. I, I don't know if you got to tune in to Pastor's sermon on our Thanksgiving service. I don't remember the exact date, but it was the Sunday before Thanksgiving 2020. And it was a beautiful collection of how God has been so faithful during this whole lockdown process. During this whole pandemic, we were blessed to get to come back into our churches in April, even understanding that some in California still haven't been coming on to almost a year of not being able to go back to their churches. But one of the beautiful things was in that lockdown time, one of the things Pastor had said that he wanted to accomplish this year was to start streaming online. And during that time, I had just gotten a job. I'm just testifying on God's amazingness for a minute. But I had just gotten a job February 6th working at Klein High School. And then exactly a month later, March 6th, we left for spring break, the longest spring break we've ever had because it, it didn't end until we went back to school September. But God was so faithful to allow me to keep getting paid from that job that I had worked at for a month and to continue getting paid and as I, as I was paid, it freed me up to come to church during the week, learn how to do all this live streaming, learn how to edit, get, uh, get a William across the road at another church to come and help me with all of his knowledge and just so much learning we got to do. The same thing with Paul. It's like he got paid vacation because they wanted to whittle down the amount of people that were working at the airport during the lockdown because not many people, if any, were flying. And he got two weeks of vacation right at the moment that Pastor got the great idea to totally remodel the front of the, of the sanctuary. And it's just beautiful how God does that. So even though it may have been frustrating to be separated and have this online I tell you what, last week, last Sunday, when we were quarantining, it was a blessing to be able to put it on my TV and crank up the TV and worship with y'all and sing with y'all and be encouraged by the word, be encouraged by Pastor's introduction to Philippians and be encouraged by the sermon that he gave. It was just a beautiful thing. And so God works. He's working on our behalf. And I just love Paul's attitude here. I can learn from his example because here he is. He's been imprisoned in his own home for two years simply because he's preaching the good news of Christ, not because he was involved in a terrorist act, not because he had hate speech, but he's preaching gospel that Jesus Christ came because he loves you. He died for you. He wants to save you. And yet he realizes that his current circumstances of being imprisoned aren't nearly as important as is what he chooses to do with them. So did you hear what I said there? He realizes his current circumstances aren't nearly as important as what he will choose to do with them. And so whenever they said, you can't meet, we said, we'll figure out how to meet, whether it's online, in the, in the cloud, in the sky, <laughs> virtually, or, or however we're going to do it. And so how we choose to act in challenging situation is going to reflect what we truly believe. That's another thing God has shown me through this whole process, even through the process of being quarantined the whole time. What am I going to learn here? What do I really believe? What's really important? Do I really believe that he orders my steps? 
Do I really believe that he takes all things and he works them out together for my good? And we just need to think about that. We can look for ways to demonstrate our faith in bad situations. And even when our emotional reserves are almost depleted, we can encourage ourselves in the Lord. And if I choose to respond in a way that honors God, then my faith is going to grow stronger, whether or not my situation improves. And so that's the beauty of it. My faith grows stronger. That's what, that's what lasts for eternity. And so these situations are not going to last for eternity. And that's what I love about Pastor Scott even. I know Paul's like this too. I learn a lot from these two men of God in my life. I love it how we can be just anywhere. We can find a sale at Costco that blesses his socks off, and he can be like, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And I'm like, what are you praising for? Look at this great deal. I'm like, okay. He takes it seriously when it says give thanks in all things. And, and even how pastor takes a stand on those things that – Maybe other pastors think are too politically, they've got to be a little too political correct for us to hear those passages of the scripture in their church. But I'm grateful for a pastor who preaches the truth and the whole truth of God's word, not just pick and choose what makes us feel good. I can say that I've been challenged in many a sermon to take it up a notch. Let's really represent Christ well, and I love that. We've, that's what we have to do. We have to choose to have the right attitude about what we're going through. So let's go on. Verses 15 through 19. Let's read those together. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way, so I rejoice. You see that? He's choosing joy. I rejoice. And I will continue to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. So again, let's just check out Paul's God-glorifying attitude here. So some who he's referring to were preaching to build their own reputation by taking advantage of Paul's imprisonment so they could make a name for themselves. Oh, well, Paul's kind of out of commission, so we'll get out here and we'll preach, and then people will start following us. But Paul didn't fall into the trap of offense. That's what stuck out to me. He didn't fall for that strategy of the enemy. He didn't choose to get offended. He didn't become judgmental or even depressed or discouraged. No, he regarded his imprisonment as being appointed by God. And all he cared about was that the gospel was getting out and others were being led to Christ. He knew what really mattered. So let me just ask you, as God was asking me, so I'll return the favor and ask y'all, do you see your current lockdown situation as being appointed by God? Like I mentioned earlier, do you believe that Christ orders the steps of the righteous and that he works all things together for your good? Or are we falling for the strategy of self-pity that the enemy wants to distract us with? Why am I saying distract us with? Well, because if God really had some other things he wanted to do in you and through you during when everything is shut down, then don't fall for that distraction of the little self-pity party being thrown over to the side. Push that away and keep going toward everything that God has for you. And is, is our why me focusing, focus keeping us from taking full advantage of this time where we can be shut away with God? 
What does God want to prepare us for? As for me, I trust that God's power to deliver me is greater than the power of this lockdown. You got to believe that too. I love what pastor said last week in a sermon. You don't wait until the time of battle to start preparing. You start preparing in boot camp. And some of us need to start our own little boot camp on ourselves, get more disciplined in the things that God's been challenging us to do and to take on and to press into and and let him prepare us for what's waiting on the other side of this lockdown because there is another side of this lockdown. At the beginning of this lockdown, we took our Bible studies online. We didn't want to stop meeting together and studying about the steps to freedom in Christ or the grace course. We wanted to be equipped for when this great awakening, which I believe is not too far in the distant future, that we are going to experience a great awakening and many are going to be coming to us and saying, teach me about this Jesus. Teach me about Jehovah God. And we need to be equipped and ready for that. Not stuck in the mire of a pity party. Going on, we're going to read scriptures that in my New Living Translation Bible are titled, Paul's Life for Christ. Verses 20 through 26. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. Verse 23, I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Isn't that wonderful? So in verse 23, where Paul's talking about, I'm torn between two desires, it's describing a tug of war, so to speak, where strong pressure is being applied to a person. This is the definition of it. Strong pressure is being applied to a person from two different directions. Another beautiful revelation that came from Rick Renner's sparkling gems from the Greek is the explanation of how Paul viewed death when he was talking about death would be better for me. The word Paul chose to use in this passage means departure, which signals the beginning of the next part of his journey into eternity. The Greek word for depart pictures, and I love this definition, and now when I, when I go to a funeral or I experience the loss of a loved one, I love this definition of it. A ship that is being loosed from its moorings so it can finally be free to sail. Isn't that a beautiful word picture? That to him death meant being set free from the human limitations and physical restrictions that had been imposed on him in this earthly life. And once liberated, he would be able to set sail in the spirit and soar to spiritual heights he had never before attained. But what God also showed me uh, is about how that because of his love and his um, tender-hearted compassion toward these people of the Church of Philippi and their partnership and that camaraderie that they had built, his desire to be there and bless them, not just not, not saying it's selfish, but in a way if he'd have been like, I'm out of here, going to heaven is much easier, 
But instead, it's that selfless giving of himself for their interest to see them become everything that they could be. And I love that. But it also, all of that and understanding that also gives us a little bit of revelation and helps us understand what we'll study in a couple of weeks in Philippians 3 when Paul writes, I press toward, and that word press is like a foot racer who's, who's there about to come to that finish line and they're stretching trying to Beat the guy that's running neck and neck to them, that they're stretching for and pressing toward the mark, which in the Greek stands for the finish line. It's like reaching that finish line for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so he knew that Christ was his prize, and that word prize in the Greek means reward given to those who won their competitions in the public games. So see, God's telling us, you're in this world, but you're not really of the world But just like the onlookers and King Darius and those who had thrown Daniel into the lion's den were looking at him, and just like the king that threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire were looking, their lives were changed. That was a public game there. That was a competition for faith in God to the rules or the laws of the land. And God won. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego won. And Daniel won because of the power of God. And so I love that. That's kind of what we're dealing with. In some way, it feels like we're involved in these public games, whether it's on social media or whatever, of who's right and who's wrong and which prophetic word is right, which prophetic word should we give up on. No, it's not a game. We're going to stand in faith. We're going to press toward that prize of Christ. We're going to hold on to his word and win that competition, win that prize of Christ. And then this last passage of scripture is called Live as Citizens of Heaven, as the subtitle in my Bible. Verses 27 through 30, read with me. Verse 27 Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Verse 28. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Verse 30, we are in the struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. That's such a beautiful closing. I love this where he's saying, this is one of my favorite verses in this chapter, is don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. And who is our enemies? Is it the guy who's talking bad about me at work? Is it the girl in my family that thinks I'm not doing something right? Who is our enemy? No. Our enemy is unseen. It's the enemy of our soul. The enemy that in the end wants to rob us of our future of eternity. That wants to rob us of our joy. Wants to rob us of our purpose and what God's called us to. Rob others of the freedom of hearing the message that we need to share so that they can see there's hope in Christ. And so I love that. Don't be intimidated. And this is going to be a sign to them that they're going to be destroyed. And let me just encourage you and that you are going to be saved even by God himself. 
I used to give the enemy bullets to shoot at me by things that would come out of my mouth. Negative things I would say, whether it was about myself, my situation, oh, things will never change. Oh, this is happening or that's happening. And it was like, oh, the enemy's like, okay, all right, so you want that negative thing. Okay, we'll bring that. That'll discourage you. Okay, I'll put that bullet in my gun and shoot it at you. No, you've got to change what you're decreeing in the face of the enemy trying to smack talk you. When he's trying to intimidate you, when he's trying to shut you down, when he's trying to stop you, when he's trying to derail you from the path that God's put you on, you just can't fall for it anymore. You can't let him push your buttons. You've, gonna, you've just literally got to sass him back and be like, oh, I'm sorry, no. No, that's not going to work anymore. I know I used to throw fit last every time you'd push that button, but I, I, de, I detached that wiring. It doesn't do that anymore. Now, if you pick on me, I'm going to start praising the Lord really loud where you can hear it. And you've got to just smack talk him back. Don't fall for the enemy's button pushing. Don't throw the fit. Don't react. Don't get angry. Trust God. He's ordering your steps. He's working in your life. He's being the author and perfecter of your faith. I love this. As we close with this last section of Scripture, I'm reminded again about the united spirit of family life. What better describes us than these words we read in verse 27, where it says, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. I know that those of you who have been in this house and probably those of you who have connected with us through the Internet, you can sense that. You sense that spirit of family and that spirit of camaraderie and unity. We love to help one another. When we hear someone's struggling, we love to go and bless them. We love to call and encourage them. We've made up our mind that we will unite together and we'll stand strong in the face of attacks from the enemy and even from the hostile world around us. Some churches have lost previously gain, gained ground by getting offended with and turning on one another. Don't fall for that strategy of the enemy. Stand together. United, shoulder to shoulder, linking up your shields of faith to make this strong, impenetrable wall that stands against the attacks of the enemy. Be courageous. Maintain the common purpose of serving Christ for the glory of God the Father. Let's go back and read verse 29. Verse 29 says, For you have not been given only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. And so now that I'm further along in my journey with the Lord and, and in my maturity in the Lord, it's easier for me to embrace suffering. Why? Because I've learned there's benefits from suffering. Number one, I don't get entitled and spoiled, but I learn to appreciate the good times. I learn to appreciate the easier times when I have to go through those times of struggles. James 1 tells us, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for pure joy, great joy. In verse 3 it says, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. How many of you can say that this testing of your faith has given your endurance a chance to grow? And I pray that you will endure to the end. Verse 4 in James 1 says, So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And I love Romans 8, 17. It says, since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, my brother Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. I share the same glory of God 
that Jesus Christ shares. But it says in the rest of that verse, but if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. And that makes it easier for me to walk through the suffering when I realize what's on the other side of it. I love these life application Bible notes that point out a few more of the benefits of suffering. Number one, if we faithfully represent Christ during our suffering, our message and example affect us and others for good. Two, it takes our eyes off of earthly comforts. Three, it weeds out superficial believers. See, whenever I see that I'm kind of wimping out during suffering, it makes me look at my faith and see, is my faith really as powerful as what God intends it to be? Or am I short-selling everything that he bought and paid for in full? Number four, it strengthens the faith of those who endure. Five, it provides an example for others who may follow us. So when we suffer for our faith, it doesn't mean we've done anything wrong. So if the enemies lied to you and made you believe that, you need to just say, I'm sorry, God, I believed a lie there. I, I renounce that lie, and I choose to believe that if I'm suffering for, for my faith, it's because you want me to share in your glory, and I choose to do that. Often it's just verifying that you're, you're being faithful. So don't get discouraged. Trust God. That's a big thing we're learning right now is how to truly trust him, to truly trust him when our jobs have been infected and our, our um, income has been affected or our family relationships as we're all hunkered down in our own uh, homes is how, how it's really trying those. Our faith is tested. Do we really trust God? Do we really believe that he has a purpose in it? Use suffering to build your character and to draw you close to your Savior. Don't resent it. Don't let it tear you down. And in this chapter's final word, verse 30 reminds us we are not alone in our suffering. Not only is God with us, but all true believers are in this fight together, uniting against the same enemy for a common cause, and that's the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You'll never hear Paul urging people to go seek out suffering as if experiencing pain is a virtue. I know there's some false religions that do that, but in the scriptures, that's not what God's saying. But Paul does remind us not to forget those who are suffering, sharing our food if our cupboard is full, if we control the wheels of power, working for justice and mercy, if we're wealthy, giving generously to those who are poor, and when life is comfortable, willingly taking a share of the suffering being experienced by others, finding a way to help them, and so demonstrating to the world that the gospel is true. Amen. Let's... Let's close in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for the power of your word. Wow, every time it's just new nuggets of wisdom, new gems we uh, dig up, Lord. It's just learning new facets of your character, of who you are. Lord, we just pray that this word would go down deep, that we would water it more with the water of your word, that we would expose it to the sunlight of your presence, allowing it to grow, to grow deep roots into our spirit, that it would bear good and healthy fruit in our lives. Help those that are struggling right now. They're struggling. Their joy has been assaulted by their circumstances. I pray, God, they would be reminded that their joy is not rooted in their circumstances. It's rooted in your salvation. And we have so much to be joyful and thankful for as we consider all the benefits of your salvation in our lives. Help those that are struggling to endure to the end, 
Give them supernatural strength in their spirit as they spend time in your presence, that fullness of joy that your word told us about at the beginning of this lesson, to be filled with your joy, that joy that is our strength that will help us press through. And when we're having a hard time, remind us to encourage ourselves in the Lord. You are our rock. You are that strong place we can run to. You're also a tender comforter. You're compassionate. You're patient with us, and we thank you for that. We pray that this word would bear much fruit in our lives, God, and we give you praise for it, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us, and come back at 1030. We'll have a, an awesome word coming to you from the Lord. God bless you, and have a great week.